<laughs> Brett Wagner, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me, guys. It's great to have you. For sure. So your character actor, you've been in uh, just about everything from like Disney Channel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is where you're best known as the, quote, lost Leatherface. That's right. Hannah Montana to Leatherface. It's a yeah. quite the <laughs> jump. Um, you know, when you're starting, I live in L.A., right? So mm -hmm. when I started trying to be an actor at 21, um, I had no idea what I was going to be doing. You know, I wanted to be, I loved horror movies, so I wanted to be in horror movies. But, uh, you know, 30 years of acting, you and you're, if you have decent agents and you 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 will get in for good stuff and it, it could be a horror movie it could be you know doing being in Hannah Montana I've done a lot of Disney stuff yeah and I'll tell you what's yeah. good about Disney Disney pays the next week oh nice it's not at the, end of the week they pay there's no waiting around where's my oh, check yeah. there's Disney, no 30 day out well you got to figure man Disney's got the money too right like sure. Disney has no reason to dick anybody over financially they've got the money to 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 pay out well it's like when I work corporate video jobs it's always the really rich companies who are like yeah you 30 days and I'm like you I know you have the money you could just pay us right now but no you're making us wait Nothing worse than waiting for money. I'll tell you a funny story real quick. So when I was very young, I got a modeling job, right? I was a big guy doing something for Target or somebody. And I was like, cool. You know, I paid like a thousand bucks for the day. And I was like, man, that's fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. I mean, a thousand bucks today, I'd still take and be like, yeah, what do you got? Yeah, so um, and then the guy said, well, he has 30 days to put. There's no union for for modeling, right? So yeah. there's no uh, there's no union, I don't think. At least there wasn't when I was doing it. There's no, he doesn't have 30 days he has to pay. So after two months, I told my agent, I said, what's going on, man? I want my thousand bucks. And he said, We'll get it. It's up to him. I said, you know, so I took it upon myself because we shot at his house. And I went over there on my Harley, knocked on his door, and he goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, give me my thousand bucks now. <laughs> Did he give it to you? Uh, he gave it to me. There it is. There it Put is. My phone on the I said, this check better not bounce. <laughs> I'm not going to hire you again. I can't give. I could care less. Not going to work? Yeah. Why would you work right. for him again? Like You don't like, roll up on your Harley expecting to get hired again. <laughs> that has happened to me very far and few ever in my in my yeah. acting career. I'm, I've been very blessed and lucky that, uh, I mean, I am uh, FICOR, so I can do non-union or union, but mm -hmm. the only reason I did FICOR is because when I got to be the voice of Monster Garage, we start doing it, and a year into it, uh, SAG called me and said, hey, SAG, I went after SAG and said, uh, are you the voice of this TV show? And I said, yeah, I am, I am. And they're like, well, you gotta, you're gotta, you going to have to pay a fine or something because that's non-union. I said, what? I said, well, my face is not on camera. It's just my voice. And yeah, yeah. At the time, I didn't understand, and that forced me to go FICOR because I wasn't going to give up the opportunity. And, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, of course, of course. But uh, it's, it's it makes it me available to do some non-union films in which there's a lot of uh, young filmmakers like yourself yeah. that are out there that are doing films which is you know i was just talking about i know i'm, I'm taking up the time right quick but i, I was fine. just talking to another filmmaker going without guys like you you know we're going to be in deep trouble because we don't have you know you can get these polished kids out of usc and i don't know where you went to film school if you did but I went to American University. Okay. So, but if you don't get a lot of these guys coming out of, you know, that are now all of a sudden I want to be a director or whatnot, we're in trouble if we don't have guys like you coming up and doing stuff. And yeah. because uh, then we're going to be SOL. We're going to be stuck with the same old guys making the same horror movies, yeah. making the same <laughs> movies and stuff. And they yeah. get a little boring. You need that new fresh blood in there. You, you need fresh blood. Yeah. Most well, literally. It, it's interesting because I think horror goes through peaks and valleys with that right like there's definitely been eras of horror where exactly what you just described was the status quo it's just mm -hmm. a bunch of like bigger named really well funded and not very creative directors making horror movies that could have been much better if somebody younger and fresher had been given the opportunity but then that inevitably leads to people like you getting well people have to take chances right it's it's hard for pe some people like that to take chances i think you know and, that, and yeah. that's the danger right yeah. is like getting too comfortable i think but do you can you imagine real quick so uh you know i've been in some movies that were a hundred million dollars to make i've been in a movie that was 30 million dollars to make i've been in a movie that was three hundred thousand dollars to make that three hundred thousand dollar movie i did looks like it was a 30 million dollar movie yeah. mm -hmm. 30 million dollars you and I could literally go out 
but we could probably make 60 movies. However, you can make a ton of movies. Yeah. You can make a franchise. Thirty million dollars. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I could. I could take. I could do. We could do 30 movies for a million dollars. Right. Yeah, right. A million dollars. People go, well, they don't make movies. I'm like, they're making movies way less than that. And they look good. And people are yeah. watching them, especially now, like yeah. with the tech and how cameras have revolved and what you can get for not paying tens of thousands of dollars. People can get professional looks now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. that's amazing. Well, yeah, and it's interesting, like, I, you know, just to bring it back to the idea of Leatherface, like, <laughs> guys like Toby Hooper were making mm-hmm. movies for, you know, absolute shoestring budgets that ended up being the most iconic movies in history, right? Well, like, money money is never that important to a movie. Right, because the art, I feel like it's the art that's dictating the fact that the movie's happening at all, and yeah. that's going to find a way to happen one way or the other, and some of that desperation works for things like Texas Chainsaw, right? Like, that's yeah. some of the magic sauce of like that original movie. So yeah, now that we're back to Texas Chainsaw, tell us the legacy of the lost Leatherface and why why do your fans us, know you take as us the lost? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um gosh, it's uh you know, I never used to talk about this. As a matter of fact, I, I just I wouldn't talk about it for years because I was very bummed sure. that I didn't get to finish that movie. So here I was here's it goes. Like as I said, I I uh you know, my first movie I ever watched was like children shouldn't play with dead things. Very campy, cheesy flick that oh, yeah. we should think we should think about redoing because it's still good. Uh, Night of the Living Dead. Then as I got, you know, a little bit older, I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I'm just like, wow, you know, it's, it was one of the most brutal movies that I'd ever saw. At least they make you think that it's brutal. There's yeah. not a lot of. Yeah, movies, right. But it was definitely the scenario people go that's the bloodiest movie i ever saw and i go no no, no it but really isn't <laughs> not really however like you said it was just a great movie so flash forward i think 2002 um maybe april or may or something i i read that they're going to redo the movie and i read that they're looking for a local hire in texas to play leatherface i don't know where i saw it someone told me that and i was like what you're going to hire a local hire. You're going to hire some bouncer out of, you know, some strip club in Dallas. <laughs> right. They're going to get some ex, ex Dallas cowboy, you know, guy that blew out his knee. That's some big guy. And I was just like, totally bummed. Didn't know what to do, but, you know, cause they weren't casting in LA. So I had no idea how to get a hold of anybody. And by just by chance, I was walking into a commercial audition one day, student tie kind of thing. And I, Go in there and I see TCM up on the board. You know, they have different rooms. It was like room A, TCM. And I was like, what? It's got to be Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Called my commercial agent, said, hey, can you call down there to that? Forget the casting director was doing this, just casting a very small part for for them to get someone hired. And he says, yeah, let me call her. Called her and said, hey, Brett would like to come in. And if they haven't cast Leatherface yet, would love to throw himself on tape. And she knew me, knew I was a big guy. And said, all right. So then can you come in tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. So I, I went to the Salvation Army. I don't know if you guys have those. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, sure. Oh yeah. I mean, I was already big at like 350 at the time. Found a giant suit, you know, which was great, but it was very tight on me. And I went in. I said, what do you want to do? I said, just roll the camera. And I started talking. I said, hey, Mr. Michael Bay. I said, look at do not waste this iconic role on somebody that has never played the part some bouncer, some friend of the production company, some giant dude. It wasn't some steroid guy. He was a big meaty bastard. And, uh, you know, uh, um, it's just an iconic role. And, uh, I, I was born to play this part and I, I want a shot at it. And then I picked up her, her little assistant that was working the camera and she squealed cause she didn't know I was going to pick her up. And I threw her over my shoulder. She fought for a second and I had her over my shoulder. I said, I'll see you in Texas, Mr. Bay. <laughs> and then she's like, that it? I said, that's it. That's, yeah, whatever. I took a shot, right? You said, yeah. take a gamble, yeah. right? You never know what's going to happen. They said, take a shot, and you took an intern. So there you yeah. go. That's right. Took an intern. Yeah. <laughs> and she, two hours later, she called me and said that Michael Bay thought you were funny. You got the gig. And I was like, oh, shoot. Amazing. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah. wait a minute. So how long do I have? I said, you have two months, and then we're going. So uh, then, you know, you're going to meet the um, – Andrew Foreman, I think I, Andrew, the guys at, um, platinum dunes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting all those guys and they're like, Oh, you ready to, you know, go on Leno and Letterman. And I said, absolutely. And plus I'm taking the chainsaw when I'm done. And they go, I don't know if that's going to, I said, listen, it's happening. (laughs) It's a chainsaw. This intern, your choice. Flash forward a couple months later where I think we're in, uh, it's July or August. We're in Texas filming. 
about 35 minutes outside of Austin. And, you know, the first real week of filming, I did a couple little things on camera, nothing that was major. And then the first big day of shooting was like, you know, kill uh, that Eric Balfour with the sledgehammer and then kept dragging him and dragging him and dragging him. And that day we didn't have a, my stunt double in and uh, I'm starting to heat up, man. And I, you know, it's, it's Austin. We're in a hot, we're, you know, outside of Austin, we're in a house, August in Texas, I have more padding on me I've ever had in my life. And I could just feel it. I'm just like, man, hopefully we'll get through this real quick before I take a dive and pass out because of the heat. And after like 30 minutes, I just kept dragging them and they weren't happy with it. Then I, I you know, I fell down for a second. I said, I got to take this mask off. And went outside, drank literally eight Gatorades, well, all the Gatorade they had. Whoa. And after 30 minutes, I was like, you know, they had, a, you know, they had the paramedic that was on this, on the set. And she goes, you all right? I said, I am all right. And I went to stand up. So what happens when you get heat stroke, all the muscle, all the water is out of your, you know, yeah, yeah. Your, your muscles as well as, of water. My back just tightened up on me and I was like, oh, man. So I went in and finished the scene because then I had to slam the door shut. We had to go drag him some more and they put him on a skateboard. Wow. Someone had a skateboard, which helped. Uh, it's not that he's heavy. He's just, you know, tall and gangly. And, yeah. and you're doing it over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could have used my stunt double that day. It wasn't there. I mean, to be honest, when we were doing the testing for the, the outfit, I told them in an air conditioned room within five minutes, I'm sweating already. Sure. So can we get a cool suit? You know, like fat, uh, Mark, Mike Myers wore in Fat Bastard underneath mm -hmm. that thing. Yeah. We don't have the budget for that. And I was like, all right. <laughs> You know, so, I, you know, if I would have now, I would demand it if sure. I got the gig sure. and just say, look, it, I'll pay for it myself. I don't care because, you know, it's um, it's very tough when you're all of a sudden you are the you're the freaking guy, man. You yeah. are leather. It's very few characters you can play in this business, you know, that aren't you can't play Freddy Krueger. They tried that didn't work. Right. Uh, you know, can't do pinhead. They tried that didn't work. I mean, you know, Leatherface, if they like you, they're, they're going to use you. You're going to, my buddy Dan Yeager was in part three and I thought he was going to get, he signed a deal to do many, but then they, uh, I think Millennium Films or whatever uh, took over and that, that whole contract was done. So, you know, I, I, listen, it was a great experience. But uh, yeah, so the people didn't know that because I never talked about it. I didn't get the credit on IMDb. Mm -hmm. um, sure. They didn't put it down. So people were like, you didn't play Leatherface. And I'm like, well, okay, I, I, I did. And I can show you the difference Wrong between screen. the men. Yeah. 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 And honestly, you, your kill when you come up behind him, sledge him in the back of the head is still one of the most memorable moments of that film to me. And yeah. to me, it... It likens very much back to the original Chainsaw, when the first time you see Leatherface is a shocking moment. It comes out of nowhere, and they figured out a new way to do it for that. So, I mean, I think you've managed to mark a very specific moment in like horror history with that kill, too. Yeah, it's it's very fun. Yeah, I, I so I went and met um, Gunnar Hansen one day. Dan Yeager from Texas 3D was signing at a show in in the L.A. and I went to go see him and I'm like, Oh, and I'm like, Holy crap. That's Gunnar Hansen over yeah. there. So I had just picked up a new agent, which was his agent. Oh, nice. And the reason his acting agent picked me up was because I told him, I said, by the way, I played Leatherface. I know you rep. He goes, uh, you know, I rep Gunnar Hansen. Well, I got to rep you then. And I'm like, Oh, perfect. So I told Gunnar, he was really sweet man was said, I'm sorry to hear that you got hurt. And, and he, uh, I had a couple of Funko pops I wanted signed. And he says, I'm not going to charge you. At all. No way. And I was like, well, I got to pay you to do something. He goes, nah, what a nice guy. Yeah. Gunner, Gunner, well, was you a guys sweetheart. are Sawyer family, right? Yeah. yeah. So let, let me ask you, did you, yeah. did you do stunt work before you did? Like, do you have any experience of doing stunt work at all? Or just, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh okay. yeah. So you can even watch 10 years, uh, went through 2002, eight years later or uh, seven years later, I'm filming the crazies with Timothy Oliphant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got to do all my own fight work. I was just very careful. I, you know, I, I drank, I drank a, a shiznit ton of Gatorade and had a couple bananas for potassium. Hell yeah. But we were, you know, and then I did, a, you know, a full burn on that one too. So that was great. And getting to do a full burn and getting on the cover of Fangoria magazine, you know, that's like, uh, yeah, that was always a goal of mine. Never thought it would ever happen. And then I was like, holy crap, I'm on the cover of Fangoria. Yeah. 
you got to do it twice, right? So you got to do it twice. <laughs> yeah. We got to get you back on the cover of Fangor. Other times. Yeah. And dude, speaking of remakes that don't suck, mm -hmm. The Crazies, 2010 The Crazies, is yes. one of my favorite horror remakes ever. Like, I think it pays proper homage to the original, and it's also its own thing. Yeah, the, you know, I, the original, I forgot I watched it. It really had nothing to do with creatures or anything. No. And I, I went in for the audition. John Papsidera, he's a big, big, big casting director in Los Angeles. Great guy. And um, I acted like a friggin' zombie like a truck driver zombie on a phone. And then I walked out and I'm like, just thinking to myself going, wait a minute, that has nothing to do with the friggin' movie. Why did I just do that? Right. It wasn't, a, you know, but, um, instinct, you know, I guess. Well, weeks later, whatever they liked me and Brett, um, Breck Eisner, Michael Eisner's kid who directed that movie, uh, you know, he liked it enough, whatever. And I got hired and it was pretty cool. You know, we got to work, uh, three weeks, uh, two weeks in Atlanta, one week in, uh, in Iowa. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it was awesome. That was a very fun movie to do. Hell yeah. That's interesting there that you're also, you're one of the most memorable crazies of that crazy movie. You were on the Fangoria cover. You think you were on a lot of the poster art too. Yeah. The back of the DVD, some of the poster art mm -hmm. I got, I got, Oh, you know, so it's very funny. The, so, um, it's not funny, but, um, <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy. I just forgot. Oh, Robert Hall. So almost human. Robert passed away last year, but very big special effects guy in 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 Hollywood. And Robert was one of the first guys to ever put me under makeup. Got me a gig on Angel and Buffy, you know. And then uh, I, I did a movie for him, Chrome Skull. But when I booked the Crazies, it's like, man, I booked this movie, The Crazies. He's like, well, I'm doing the makeup for it. So I'll Amazing. see you in a couple of weeks, right? So it was great. But we had a scene when I turned underneath that thing, underneath the truck, and I'm after Timothy hits me with a big wrench, and I turn around real slow. The the people thought, or whoever checks on this stuff thought, I look so gross that there's no way that they. So they had to tone it down through color enhancing through the you know through the the, the film, and I was like, what? And then the, I remember we did the premiere, and one of the executive producers comes over. You cost me a lot of extra money. 200,000 bucks. And I'm like, what did I do? And I said, well, don't blame me, man. If it looked gross, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's... Sorry that they wanted to wimp out on the blood. Yeah. Were they worried that it was like an MPAA thing? Like they weren't going to get yeah, the they said that wow. that whole thing There just was too, it's too realistic. And I'm like, this is 2010. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> right. Right. I mean, have, you ever, you know, have you ever watched it? What was it? The last house on the left and seen some of this stuff that goes on in movies. Come on. Yeah. 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 It's, it's nothing. So I got a random question. On IMDb, it says that your nickname is the Big Schwag. And I noticed that on a lot of your roles, uh, you're also credited as Schwag. Where did this name come from? So I've always tried every, to do everything, right? If you're going to be an entertainer, you just try everything. And Sure. Yeah. I wanted to be an actor. I, I decided to become, become an actor. I used to want to work with a lot of bands, and I did started going on the road doing bodyguard work for bands and one of the things i wanted to do at 30 i hit like a midlife crisis i was tired of working bars and doing security for rich millionaires that get drunk and do heroin and then they go can't play on stage and i was just like man i'm gonna get into pro wrestling so at 30 years old i got into pro wrestling and started working for that's, the minor league that's old for wrestling right way, listen way old and still way fat believe me i was <laughs> like i was like i just so I learned really quickly that uh, I wasn't going to be a, a wrestler, but I'd be a um, like a Bobby the Brain Heenan. Oh hell you yeah! Know? Hell yeah! I was I was a heel manager, but um, I what name did I use? I was like, well, I call myself the Big Swag. So uh, when I started doing Monster Garage, I was doing the voice for Jesse James on Discovery Channel's Monster Garage. I had come from the pro wrestling world, and that that producer was like can you do your wrestling voice for me on this show? And I said, yeah. So can I call myself big swag? I was trying to market myself. You know, I was already using it for five years for wrestling. And but where did swag come from? Listen, my last name's Wagner. We used to work a bar, a very famous bar in Hollywood called smalls when I was like 19. Yeah. And the guy was like, uh, Australian Tom, who was at the front door used to call me Schwagner. Why Schwagner? Okay. Throw this guy up. So then I just shortened it. Swag when I got into pro wrestling because I didn't know what to do. I'm like, all right, big swag. And then I was like, Australians, big swag, swag, swag. That's hilarious. Yeah. 
You know what? That's, you know what? That's like dirty weed swag. It, it, yeah, yeah. Well, that's oh, what yeah. I first thought. I'm like swag. We're Interesting. Familiar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The brown stuff at the bottom of the Ziploc. What's funny is when we were like the fourth year into the Monster Garage way back when, one of the young producers comes over. He goes, "You know what swag is? It's dirty weed, dirty, stinky, dumb, just <laughs> not get you high weed." And I was like. It's too late now, buddy. Four years has big swag. You can't change it now. You gotta lean into That's it. Hilarious. You know, <laughs> so no one got it. No one, no one figured no one ever well, came then, about it. So. so you said you did security work for, for bands. What's your what was your favorite band to do security work with? What's your oh, least favorite band to do security work with? And who was the craziest band that you did security work with? Oh, you are uh you know, I worked some danger I worked for some rappers, which back in the day was a little dangerous back in those times. Sure. Sure. I won't mention their names, but they were always they were fun, but they were dangerous. But they needed their big redneck. You know, it was good, especially if they were going to Bakersfield or they were going to Fresno, mm-hmm. some redneck town. They were like, "Hey, you want to come work?" And I'd be like, "Yeah, let's go." Hell yeah! In case some rednecks got out of line, you know. Um, <laughs> It'll and happen. then, uh, you know, Jane's Addiction, uh, Sonic Youth, some old, some of these oh, bands that I was yes. working for. Hell I love yes. they were great. Um. Some of the bands I dislike doing a couple couple gigs with Guns N' Roses. I could that I can understand. Check, that that. Yeah, I don't know that, that anyone has anything nice to say about Axl Rose. That doesn't sound good. Like, well, yeah, and that's the problem, right? Yeah. Because every had their own bodyguard. Um, and then there was a couple. You know, it was just they get you in fights. You know, there's no oh, point sure. going because you know, he knows he's got six or seven big guys. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've done a lot of cool, a lot of cool band, like a lot of a lot of rock and roll bands, and then plus I MC as well, right? So I'm a professional MC, so I go work Sturgis, mm-hmm. Hell yeah. and I work at Easy Easy Rider Saloon, and I'd be there for 11 days introducing every single band on stage. So nice, wow, you know, which is fun, and um, yeah, it's good. It's it, it, there's some good times. A lot of you know, I, I come from. So I graduated high school in 86, but I was going to punk shows, you know, like when I was in the eighth grade, I was trying to sneak it out. And we were going to punk shows. So punk rock and, you know, 82, 83, 84, even up to 86 in Los Angeles and Hollywood was a big deal. So we got to go see a lot of bands and I started working a lot of at clubs that as long as I kept my grades up, my dad was like, hey, if you can get a ride or someone gives you a ride and you want to work and. So 16 years old, I'm working a club called the Seven Seas, which is a very famous club in Hollywood. We called it the Seven Sleas. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, it was rough. But um, and I was 16. I couldn't work inside, but I worked the parking lot telling people, put those, put the heroin away. But you can't come in, dude, to put that, you know. Right. Oh, so I was going to ask if you, you got to see all the bands really. for free, but it sounds like you were stuck out in the parking lot. Well, up until I got to about 18, then I could work inside. Oh, but, okay. uh, all right. Sure, sure. All right. Did you grow up in L.A.? San Fernando Valley. San Fernando. Oh, the Valley. Yes. Excellent. Everybody. Excellent. I got a big SFV. What do you What do you have tattooed there? The San for SFV. Oh, very cool. Oh, oh nice. Very cool. So, yeah, something dumb idiots do when they're probably drunk and shouldn't have got it done. But um, <laughs> I have a couple. You know, of those. Um, yeah, growing up in the Valley was great. Uh, so you're 20 minutes from Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 25 minutes from Hollywood. You know, you're 35 minutes from downtown. There used to be when I was working the clubs back then. There was just uh, there was a two or three clubs every single night that were going off with music. You know, sure. Uh, sure. I used to work a place called the Scream where I saw everybody. You know, one night was Jane's Addiction, Sonic Youth, Fishbone. The next night was the Cult. Wow. Uh, nice. The Ramones, somebody else, oh, and I was wow. just you know I was just like wow, this is overload. And then we always <laughs> had Magic Mount, right? So. In the eighties, for uh, you know, with all the new wave, I also like the new wave scene. That I sure. that was my. Thing. We had Magic Mountain, the big amusement park, and they had everybody playing there. The mm. tubes, you know the. Oh, the tubes! Fuck yeah, the yeah. tubes! What a great yeah. Band. So uh, music was a big part of my life growing up. But uh, speaking of working the doors, so when I used to work the clubs in L.A., you know, I'm twenty twenty one years old. I was working with R. A. Mihailov. Hell yeah! Oh, Another yeah. Leatherface. We've met yeah. R. A. We met R. A. So, yeah. Yeah, so we used to be working the clubs together and throwing people out. And oh, he's a big dude too. Yeah, he's a big guy. He's one of the nicest guys yeah. in the world. Yeah. yeah. So 100%. he was one of the first guys when I got that gig. Right when the casting director called me, he's the first person I called. All right, yeah. What's up, Schwag? Oh, I just guess I'm going to be the new Leatherface. What? Oh, that's great. Yeah. I yeah. called people literally in like 20 minutes. 
And then the casting director called me back like an hour later. By the way, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> excellent. <laughs> so then I was like, I gotta, I gotta call most of these people back and tell me, yeah, they're gonna give me some other gig. They they decided that uh, oh, I was wow. too pretty or something. But um, <laughs> I'll write a book about it and call it Leatherface for a week. So we'll. I do. That would be. I would buy that. I yeah. Would read that. yeah, I would read it. Earlier, you mentioned FICOR, uh and as opposed to SAG. And can you explain that for those who are not? Uh, familiar with the film industry terms. I'm FICOR. So what that means is I I, I, I can still do non-union if I want to, but everything everything else is SAG and everything. A lot of guys that do horror movies and stuff, especially from back in the seventies and eighties, they're all FICOR because they're, they're not, they may not be getting the Robert England work. They're not working on yeah. you know big stuff, but they're getting some smaller movies that directors are doing. So they, they can't, you can't mess with the union, you know. You start messing with the union, and then they'll yeah. I used, mess to, with I used to live with Robert Zadar. Do you know Robert Zadar, maniac cop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The oh, chin. Yeah. You were you lived with him? Yeah, we lived together for two years. So Robert was a great guy, but Robert would every year when you go to these film festivals, AFI, I think, and some of these other companies, these where they have these film festivals and stuff, and everybody's coming in to buy your movies. He was always on like four or five different built, you know, posters. And SAG would be like, those aren't union. That was like, <laughs> you know, he would get in trouble for it, but he figured it out. And yeah, it was pretty cool, man, living with the, the maniac cop. Hell That's yeah. amazing. That's wild. The chin himself. The chin himself. Great guy. He passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. But yeah, that was sad. He uh, he used to come to a big nightclub I worked. So it was called Vertigo in downtown LA. So that's mm -hmm. how we met. And he was like, I got a room. If you know anybody, you want. I'm like, man, I'll move in with Maniac Cop. Let's go. Hey, let's Hell do yeah. this thing. Hell yeah. <laughs> but who could say no to the Maniac Cop? Not many. So we got a few fast horror questions for you. Yep. What is your favorite horror movie? Dawn of the Dead, 1978. Oh, yes. Yes. Great pick. Respect. Great pick. Yes. Great pick. Who's your favorite horror villain? Man. You can't say Follow Leather your gut. You can't say Leatherface. Christopher Lee. Oh, because oh. he's so many villains, yeah. Yeah, but he's just so, you know what? He, he, he's my vampire, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, well, you know that he's also, he was like a, he was like an actual James Bond-style secret agent during World War II. The a there's Nazi a, hunter, yeah. There's a famous story when he was filming Lord of the Rings. There's a scene where he gets stabbed in the back in the two towers. And initially, Peter Jackson was like, you need to scream, when you get you need to scream more when you get stabbed and christopher lee was like no no no, that's not the noise that a person makes when they get stabbed in the back <laughs> and, yeah peter, ja peter, jackson peter jackson was jackson. like what yeah jackson and says imagine the sound of someone getting stabbed in the back to which he replies i need not to imagine the sound yeah yeah it just he get like but that dude just oozed villain it's good you know um yeah i just love hammer pick i love all that stuff and now a lot of it you know i would love to remake vampire circus and oh, um, yeah oh yeah so much stuff from their catalog that is good. And then some of it also, it's just like Fulci, like Zombie uh, is one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. My favorite poster by far. I have oh, that yeah. in my, one of my, I got, I bought it 30 years ago and Tom Savini had signed it. So oh, I'm, I'm like tickled pink about that. But um, I have a Tom Savini signed Dawn of the Dead poster hanging upstairs. Him and Kim Forey. Yeah. Yeah, Man. classic too. <laughs> Ken, I mean, Ken Forey's a great guy. I've yeah. met him a bunch of times. We get Very our nice pictures, guy. convention pictures done at the same place. So once in a while, or I've been at a couple conventions where he's been at, and I'm just like, oh, it's goddamn Ken Forey, man. Yeah. He's another yeah. dude that just just a monster in real life. He's huge. Like, he's and huge to be guy. fair, like I'm only five foot four, <laughs> so like anything over five ten to me is enormous. Uh, only five foot. You look taller. And the... it's it's I got a special stool. He's on the stool. Look so much taller. Yeah, because I'm I'm not about six he's, three. Yeah, he's <laughs> he dwarfs me. All I can say, don't go to prison. No, at five. No, 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 no. I uh, but no, I've I've been in the same room as Ken Forey, and he is just enormous in real life. Like you don't. He's big easy. man. Um. Okay, a recent horror movie that you've loved. Man. Okay. So. I'm going to tell you too. Uh, and recently, in the last couple of years, uh, the platform gets yeah. on Netflix. Yep, Netflix. Platform. Yep, that movie was brilliant. Is it what a horror movie you would you know classically think some kind of you know the, no? It's a psycho it really? It's a psychological horror for sure. It's really good. And then a movie called Rent a Pal. Rent a Pal. I haven't heard about that one. Rent a Pal, man. So this is a great movie. Very small cast. Um, guys just uh, has issues with life and. 
is on a dating service trying to, uh, you know, and he takes a video and the guy talks about, you know, Hey, we're going to pump you up a little bit for these, uh, for these dates. And the guy kind of on the, on the VHS tape, this guy watches this so much. He knows what he's going to say to him all the time. And he starts having conversations with him. And uh, I'm just going to, I don't want to get into it too much. He starts, you know, the guy on camera, I mean, all on the V on the VHS is, uh, kind of taking over this guy's life and it, it just goes from there and it's it's very well done hell yeah rent a pal okay cool right. I'll, watch that. I'll watch that all right now favorite horror hero slash survivor i guess you know they, they can't all be heroes but they can sure as hell not be the villain well my, mr boomstick is probably uh mr ash yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, bruce campbell man mm -hmm, mm -hmm. bruce campbell i mean you know the evil the dead, other uh, chin right he's the other person with the nickname the chin yeah, the up chin. What a what a very nice guy. Uh, always, uh, if you see him, at least when I've seen him on the streets or at a at a deal, and I always go up and say hello. I'm like you don't know me, but I'm a big fan and um, always very kind, and we'll sign something for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, who else? Who else is really? Now you know. I, if we go old school, I mean, Peter Cushing was a uh, ah yeah. Well, if, yeah. We, if we're gonna go with Christopher Lee, yeah, Cushing we might Lee. as well get our uh, Peter Cushing in there that's too. A, right? That's an iconic horror. Get duo Van Helsing right there. in there with our Dracula. Yeah, yeah. You might as well. Uh, but yeah, so I, I hear uh, what's his name is going to be playing. Uh, what's the actor now? They just had some posters out of him, bald and uh, the pointy ears, going to be playing. Um, oh, Willem Dafoe. Dafoe? No. Is that, William Defoe as Nosferatu. But didn't he already do Nosferatu in The Shadow I of the Vampire? Harry's, he I was Nosferatu. Harry, or he was yeah, Max Shrek, right? He was Max Shrek. Then someone made a really cool poster that says something coming out yeah, soon. Yeah, so that's supposed to be the new Robert Eggers project, who, uh, who's the guy who did The Witch and The Lighthouse. And he's been wanting to do this Nosferatu remake. And I'm at first they canned it and they didn't let him do it. And then he did The Lighthouse. And then they were like, okay, maybe you'll do it. But now he's doing The Northman. I don't know if they've confirmed it, but I think that's a fan made poster. Okay. But it would I'd be so down. I I'd mean, be I'd be here for it. Even if he already did play Nosferatu in The Shadow of the Vampire, I'd be down for an older Willem Dafoe to play a Nosferatu in a Robert Eggers movie for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh Robert Eggers is uh the man behind the Northman. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 Let's talk about how much money they've been spending, how much money from their budget they've been that spending movie on that. Is, and that and it looks like it. But like what struck me is how enormous this movie looks. Like just the 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 breadth of this movie is huge. Which is nice because it's sort of the polar opposite of what he did with the lighthouse, right? Which is right. everything is condensed to one location, very claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they definitely spent some uh they definitely spent some money on it. And then you can tell you can tell how big a budget is, honestly, by seeing how many commercials run, and sure. they're running on thing. Sure. You know, the crazies, we didn't run a lot of commercials, and we got stuck in between Shutter Island. Can we curse on this thing? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Shutter Island, I like to call it, even though a good buddy of mine was in it. Uh, uh, Shutter Island opened before us, and I was like, all right, that's not – okay, all right, we'll be fine. And then a week after us was uh, friggin' Johnny Depp, Alice in Wonderland. Oh. Uh, oh. Everybody went. So we did opening weekend. We did 17 million, which the movie cost. And uh, I was like, I'm like, well, that's pretty big. That's pretty good. You know, 17 million opening weekend. Not a lot of commercials. We'll clean. We'll, we'll keep going. This thing will do 100 million. But then uh, Johnny Depp ruined my chances. Damn him. <laughs> yeah. He did it on purpose. And too. That, our movie was better than that. Okay. So where can our viewers see you lately? Because you've appeared in some TV shows that have recently come out. Where can people uh, catch some Brett Wagner? You know, Brett Wagner, the big swag, a.k.a. Lost Lake yeah. Place. Uh, Where is the swag right now? It. Well, actually, hang on. Before we get there, what league did you wrestle in? Or what leagues did hmm. you wrestle in? I worked for a company called Ultimate Pro Wrestling in Orange County, California. Oh, we, yeah. were the, okay. we were the like single-A baseball for the WWF. Uh -huh. I uh, had help starting John Cena. Samoa Joe and a couple other guys, uh, nice. you know, and the problem with me was, is I'm six, five, you know, 330 pounds. So at the time I was bigger than some of the wrestlers and the WWF just back then, the WWF just couldn't figure it out. Well, this guy's just too big, you know? And sure. I'm like, but that's, but, you know, I got to work with, you know, diamond Dallas page. I got to work with Kurt angle. I got to work with triple H triple H mm. gave me a pedigree in the middle of our ring. I got to work with some really, 
famous guys that I respect. Uh, I was friends with the Road Warriors. Uh, yeah. I got that, you know, in entertainment, you do everything, right? It doesn't matter whether you're doing a podcast, whether you're doing radio, whether you're writing a book, whether you're writing a script, whether you're an actor. If you can do everything, you're more valuable to somebody. Sure. And for me, at least I, you know, I, I have these times when I get depressed. I got to do something. What am I going to do? You know, 30, I was like, what am I going to do? This is, I don't want to throw people out of bars the rest of my life. And I said, I'll get into, I'll, I'll do some pro wrestling. I'm having a midlife crisis. I'll oil up, put some shorts on that don't fit. Put some of this violence to good use. I, I call that Tuesday. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, very good. Uh, I got a movie that I did, and I'm hopefully it's coming out this year, called El Tanto. Okay. Kate Beckinsale, John Malkovich, Charlie Day, Ray Liotta. Um, Oh, a whole I, bunch of I love Charlie people. Day. Dude, that's a dope cast. Well, I mean, Charlie Day is the director, executive producer, oh, the whole bit. Hell yeah. He, wow. Then, is this Charlie's first film directing? No, he did one other thing. He did like a really, really super indie film oh, last cool. year. So he pulled in all his favors to get all these people in there. And I yeah. play like Malch's bodyguard uh, limo driver. So, uh, I got to be in a couple of scenes. I don't say nothing with those scenes, but I get to watch Malkovich, yeah, you know, work. And I was just like, that's a master. Right. This is crazy, man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Charlie Day directing Malkovich. This I have to see when it comes out. Yeah. El Tanto. Um, I'm excited about it. Hopefully it comes out this year. Other than that, I, you know, I got a couple of movies, uh, Big Freaking Rat, which is a, a horror movie by Thomas Churchill. I, I do some of his movies. Uh, oh, hell yeah. Um, but that's in Germany right now. So if you want to get it, you got to go on uh, Amazon or eBay and get the German version. Okay. The German. Which I had to do because I needed the footage for my reel. I play a homeless guy that gets eaten. By the big friggin' rat? Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, it's that sounds simple but effective. Yeah. I got a you know, couple some other folks were doing, you know, this whole doing a movie called The Grind towards the end of the year. Fan film. Texas a Chainsaw Leatherface fan film these folks are doing and. Excited to go do that. and uh, Oh, yeah, and you're yeah. playing a character named Gunner, right? Which is a, has to be a nod to Gunner Hansen. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, awesome. I, 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 yeah, so I, I won't be Leatherface, but I will be... Uh, we got a couple cool things, a couple cool things towards the end of the film that we're going to be doing. And other than that, just hustling, doing, you know, getting some conventions. And I'm a voiceover guy, too, so that's what I do, you know, mm -hmm. and I host... TV, so I try to do everything because when you get these masks done, right? When you get this stuff done, yeah, is that your mask from the 2003 film? Yeah. So for our listeners right now, we're looking at one of his personal leather face masks, which is quite beautiful. So this is uh, so I, of course when I got sent home was three days after I got hurt, so I didn't have a chance to steal a mask, or I would have. Sure. <laughs> but uh, what I did is um, Trick or Treat Studios. Scott Stoddard, the guy that did our, our masks, me and Andrews, uh, for the movie, he did a mold for them for 2003 so they could put out some masks. And the mold came off of, or the mask came off of my mold that he still had. So sure. this is as close. So there's the Wagner mask, which this is, and then there's the other ones, which Andrew wore, which is different. And mm -hmm. um, just slight subtleties, but... I got this done by a, a horror school customs. They also did an outfit for me, which is great. Uh, they're out in Louisiana and he did a full outfit. So when you go to these conventions, you know, they want to, uh, I can't, I forgot. No one's, no one can see us, but um, <laughs> when okay. you go to these conventions, they want to do pictures, you know, they want to do in costume pictures with folks. And so I got one done now and it's, it's great pretty idea. cool. It's, it's weird putting it on again after, after so long, yeah, cool. Well, hopefully we'll see you at some conventions in the next year. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. in that well, outfit I, I, even. And I, and hopefully we'll we'll get to work together. So, Absolutely, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping so too. I'm, I'm hoping so too. But hey, you know, it's been a pleasure. I I love rapping with guys like you too because we're the same thing, right? We love horror movies. Yeah, we yeah. Love, exactly. Love that business, and um, I know you direct other stuff, and you do you do a fine job. I've seen some of the video work you've done, some of the music videos. Oh, thank you. Incredible work, and uh, I've seen some of your partner there, his blue movies that are on, you know, uh, spankwire.com. We don't talk about them very much. But, <laughs> no. uh, hey, this podcast hey, doesn't fund hey, itself, you hey, know listen, what I mean? You got to do what you got to yeah, do. Yeah, I was going to say, my student loans weren't paying themselves back. <laughs> I, I got gotcha. you. 
<laughs> but anytime, thank you. It's been a privilege to talk with you guys. For sure, you man. Well. Thank Brett, you so thank much. Thank you so much for being on the show. Cool. And what's the dog's name? Cujo. Cujo. Oh, that's right. Cujo. All right. Bye, Cujo. <laughs> bye. Ha, 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 ha.